pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and esteemed colleague, Professor Steve Martin from Iowa State University. Uh, Professor Martin graduated from Purdue in 1986, uh, just before his PhD advisor actually moved to ASU and later became my own PhD advisor. So that was Professor Austin Angel, who sadly passed away uh, earlier this year. Uh, so as soon as uh, Steve graduated, he joined Iowa State uh, University right away, uh, joined the material science and engineering department there. He became a full professor in 1996, and he is by now both a university professor and a distinguished professor at Iowa State. So uh, Professor Martin is a world expert in solid state electrolyte and specifically ionically conducting uh, glasses and calcogenide in particular. Uh, he has authored more than 200 papers in the field. Uh, he's been an invited professor all over the world from Korea to Brazil to Italy. Uh, he has more than 50 invited uh, talk at international conferences. Uh, he's Outstanding work was actually recognized here in Tucson by the American Ceramic Society in 2008 uh, with the prestigious award, the More Award from the from ACERS. Uh, so today, Professor Martin will tell us about uh, the very timely topic of uh, energy storage and batteries. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Steve, Professor Steve Martin. Very good. Ah, uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, if everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you. That was uh, very, very kind. And, and indeed, uh, it's, uh, it's not quite like coming home, but uh, I'm among many friends. So uh, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'll apologize in, in advance because Beej and uh, Pierre and others, they've been uh, hearing me uh, talk about these fast iron gla conducting glasses for many, many years. And uh, I can say, yay, hooray, the United States is finally doing battery research. I won't take any claim for that, but uh, at, least, <laughs> at least I can write proposals with the word battery in them now. So uh, before I was just looking at ion conduction and so forth. So it's, uh, it's, it really is uh, a wonderful thing to see us as a, as a country and as a community and uh, as a planet uh, move as very important direction uh, of energy storage. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind uh, introduction. I'm gonna have to switch over and see if I can uh, get some things out of the way. I gotta find a, uh, there's my laser pointer. Yes, okay. Uh, of course, uh, if everyone can see this, uh, you know, all the work we faculty do uh, are, is primarily done by graduate students and postdocs. And I just wanna highlight a few of those names here. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, 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 the, uh, financial support that I've gotten from many different uh, agencies over, over these years. Uh, all of these groups here are currently uh, funding us in this area of glasses for uh, solid uh, state electrolytes. So anyway, again, thanks for the invitation and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, talking with you about the work that we've done. Well, of course, uh, I won't go into a lot of the background. Most of you know how important batteries are. Uh, in particular, lithium batteries, uh, you know, they, everyone owns a cell phone. There's on the order of 9 billion cell phones on this planet right now and, and billions being made every year. Uh, so increasing energy uh, uh, density uh, beyond the normal cell phone battery, lithium ion batteries we have, you see here, uh, the uh, lithium is stored on the anode in graphite and it's stored in a variety of transition metal oxides on the cathode. Cobalt was an early starter in this area and they've reduced the cost and increased the capacity by making these mixed manganese, nickel and cobalt hybrids. But, you, but still the capacity uh, is relatively low because it takes a lot of transition metal and oxygen to store lithium. And the capacity is pretty low because it takes six uh, carbon atoms to store one lithium atom. They're very safe, they're very functional, they add a beyond the energy densities that we could attain from nickel uh, metal hydrides and lead acid, but still these batteries are quite hindered in their, in their capacity. Um, if we go to a lithium metal anode and partner it with a sulfur cathode, sulfur uh, being uh, uh, incredibly abundant uh, as a result of our petroleum industry, uh, it lowers the voltage a little bit from a typical four volts down to three volts, 
but the capacity goes up dramatically because lith because sulfur the composition is li 21 s so one sulfur can store two lithium so the capacity goes up even at a little bit of a cost uh, for uh, voltage and therefore energy density but it's a matter of factor of four up from lithium ion so many people are working on lithium uh, sulfur but the uh, the ultimate end game here is lithium air these would be air breathing batteries uh, just like internal combustion engines we don't carry the oxygen around we don't carry the oxidizer around so therefore we can lighten up our uh, systems likewise a lithium an air breathing battery using lithium metal turns out is even more energy dense uh, than gasoline. So ultimately, I think these solid state systems are gonna be quote, air breathing batteries um, and uh, you, you create extremely high energy density. And lithium, lithium oxide, Li2O, of course, stores two lithium atoms for one oxygen. Our work in this area is to enable those real high energy densities by using solid electrolytes. There's many kinds of solid electrolytes, um, but we're working in the glassy area uh, due to the low cost and compositional flexibility that, that glasses uh, uh, afford. So why are we interested uh, in these solid electrolytes? I've talked about the or near order of magnitude increase in energy density. Uh, it's also a safety aspect. You know, lithium ion batteries, as you well know, are prone to fires and explosions due to the liquid electrolyte. The liquid electrolyte is wonderful. It has very high conductivity, uh, but yet very flammable uh, and can explode if it vaporizes into the gas phase. However, there's another aspect of solid state batteries that people don't talk about a lot. Uh, the uh, the uh, Tesla has about 70,000 uh, 18650 batteries in it. They're all round, they're all circular. And so there's just simply a packing problem uh, using those. Uh, if you move to solid state sat stacks, even with the same energy density, you get a roughly 40% increase in energy density simply because you can stack these things more efficiently uh, in, in volume. However, the other additional advantage above and beyond the energy density advantage, of course, uh, is the temperature range. Uh, the Tesla automobile contains cooling systems, temperature monitoring systems to keep those liquid electrolyte based cells in low temperature and keep them safe. Solids are so much, as all of you know, are so much more forgiving about temperatures. Uh, they don't freeze, they're already frozen. Yes, the conductivity is an Arrhenius uh, temperature dependence, but it doesn't catastrophically drop off as the liquid freezes at low temperature. And of course, uh, glass transition temperatures are three or 400 degrees Celsius, so there's no problem there. You just run into the melting point of lithium was about 180. So 160 degrees Celsius, 300 or so Fahrenheit, a common temperature for an internal combustion engine uh, makes these solid state cells uh, very flexible for an automobile uh, application. Again, because they're based on solids, they're, they're, they're abuse tolerant, uh, more abuse tolerant than uh, liquid cells. One of the big, adva big advantages of solids is this ability, it's, it's, it's being developed that these glasses and solid electrolytes can limit lithium dendrites. It's one of the main reasons for fires and explosions. These very tiny micron sized filaments of lithium that occur on high discharge and high charge rates uh, you know, we see in these uh, skateboards and so forth, these filaments uh, penetrate across the membrane, this plastic membrane. Uh, it's only 30 or 40 microns, and so they don't have to grow very long. They short out the cell, the cell catches fire, and then, of course, uh, the, as, as you've seen here in many different um, uh, pictures of this, it's a real catastrophic problem. So these solids not only are offering uh, more energy, uh, higher energy densities, but a safer operation uh, as well. So where do we start? Well, uh, Pierre introduced uh, uh, our, 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 our former mentor, Austin Angel. And this is where we started. This happens to come from my thesis research all the way back in 1986. And you can look at the, you can look at the conductivity scale, 10 to the minus 12 and so forth. That's where we started uh, with oxide glasses. 
Uh, they're wonderful. They're very strong glass formers, but the oxygen anion is very tightly binding. Uh, and as a result, the ion conductivities of these solid electrolytes uh, are pretty low. So in the separator, of course, which my talk is focusing on, uh, we have to have very high conductivity because every electron has to be matched by a lithium ion and that lithium ion has to migrate across the cell. So the conductivities have to be uh, very high. But the glasses afford this compositional tailorability. Uh, their glasses have often been called the universal solvent. And so you can vary compositions quite dramatically. And you can see that down here in my insert from 25 to 75% in that range. You can triple the concentration of lithium ions. And in doing so, uh, lower the activation energy and rather strongly increase the uh, conductivity. But oxide glasses also, they're low cost, they're easily made. Oops, sorry, went too far. And they can also be uh, very chemically stable. So we've got some advantages of oxide glasses, but we've got some disadvantages. So Pierre and Beach and other people in this community have been and listening to me talk about these sulfide glasses, one step down the periodic table. And then you can dope them with salt, just like you dope uh, sodium chloride into water and increase the conductivity, conductivity. And now you reach a value about 10 to the minus three. Orders of magnitude, of course, lower than the electronic uh, metallic conductivity of 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight. But nonetheless, this 10 to the minus three conductivity at room temperature is a pretty much a known benchmark for the conductivity. And this graph here shows some phosphate glasses, oxide glasses, and there's your low 10 to the minus eight or so. Don't change basically the same composition, take all the oxygen out, replace it with sulfur, and you get conductivities at room temperature in this 10 to the minus three range. So at least one of the prime uh, benchmarks of performance, ionic conductivity uh, can be achieved in these sulfide glasses. I'll talk about a lot more requirements in, in the coming moments, but at least that gets us into the realm uh, of possibility for these uh, compositions. That's a 10 to the four, 10,000 fold increase in conductivity, which is the enabling conductivity uh, that you need for uh, lithium ion and lithium solid state batteries. And of course, why is that? Well, it's the binding energy of the larger sulfur anion. Sulfur is on the order of about 3.2 angstroms in diameter, around one and a half for oxygen. So the charge density on that sulfur is much less. And also the polarizability of the sulfur anion is much larger. So the lithium ions can migrate through a sulfide network with much lower activation energy, a factor of two lower activation energy. And of course, because it's on Arrhenius dependence, uh, that exponential dependence on activation energy dramatically lowers the conductivity and you get this 10,000 fold increase in conductivity. Okay, but of course we know that the pure sulfide glasses uh, are, have other uh, disadvantages as well. And I'd like to talk about the story I'm gonna tell today is this compositional uh, migration or uh, walk that I've been on over the last 30 years. It, constantly improving these compositions to meet all the other uh, important battery properties that you need in batteries. Well, here's the first one, this 10 to the minus three, this conductivity in this range of about minus 25, which we can see out here in Iowa some winters, up to about 100 degrees Celsius. So we've met the conductivity uh, requirement. But another one is processability. I'll spend some time talking about how do we make a very thin piece of glass? Because in our lithium ion batteries, that polymer membrane is 30 to 60 microns, depending upon the manufacturer. We need also to be in that range, 30 to 60 microns, so we can get the overall resistance down. Uh, in order to do that, you need to be able to form the glass. And so if the glass crystallizes in its working range, you can't do that forming. But if it doesn't crystallize like some of our compositions, then you can lower the viscosity, get it into the working range, and then draw films from them like I'm gonna show you uh, today. But also through this compositional optimization process, we can make some mixed oxysulfide glasses where we uh, dramatically improve this chemical stability. And this is a plot of a typical sulfide glass, a lithium sulfide, silicon sulfide glass, that reacts immediately with air and forms hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic, of course. Our ISU, I'll show you some compositions in a moment, lithium sulfide, silicon sulfide, phosphorus oxide, these oxysulfide glasses. You see our stable 
uh, over many hours in air, which is a real uh, uh, advantage in processing and lowering the cost of the processing of these glasses. Uh, further, however, there's a whole suite of electrochemical properties that glass uh, must be able to possess. Uh, and again, one of which is stability, electrochemical stability. They have to be stable at zero volts because we're gonna use lithium metal as the anode. Lithium metal is a very strong reducing agent. There can't be any reductive or reductive uh, reactions at the anode. Uh, other than, as you see here, what are called plating and stripping, the lithium ion coming off of the glass, go, oops, going off of the glass into the uh, electrode or coming off of the electrode and into the glass. That's the primary charge transfer process. And that's what's shown here. Uh, we're, we're plating out with positive currents and stripping uh, with negative currents. And then we pull on that uh, voltamically uh, out to about five volts and there's no reactions there indicating that the electrons are the electrons now are tightly bound in the system uh, and they're not oxidized. Of course, our cathode's gonna operate out here about four volts and we don't want the glass to oxidize. We want the cathode to oxidize. And so we can see, and I'll show you some uh, more detailed on specific compositions in a moment. Um, then finally, also, we want these to be stable against lithium metal. And that's shown here where we're, we're looking at a pure sulfide glass, like a lithium sulfide, silicon sulfide glass. We put lithium metal on one side, sandwich it with glass, put lithium on the other side. And you see for that ordinary glass, this is a complex impedance diagram. Just think of it as a resistance. That resistance needs to stay small and not change. If it's changing and getting larger, that means the lithium metal is reducing the glass, producing a, a parasitic uh, electrode interface that uh, uh, dominates reaction, dominates the electrochemical performance. You can see the sulfide glasses react. This little diagram down here is our ISU oxysulfide glasses. And you can see two things, their conductivity, in other words, their resistance is lower. Their conductivity is higher, the resistance is lower. And then there's a little bit of width to these curves. There's a little bit of reaction, but it's clearly not very much, meaning that that sandwich stays just the sandwich. There's no large interfacial impedances uh, forming between the glass and the solid electrolyte, which of course we need for long-term stability. Uh, that's shown a little bit more here uh, where I've blown this curve up a lot. And then you can see uh, again, this is for the, the battery geeks out there. There's a simple arc that shows the bulk impedance. And then there's a little bit of interfacial impedance, which at 17 hours, actually, if I flip to the next slide, that impedance actually goes away. There's some kind of small interface there initially, and then that interface goes away, meaning that the interface uh, is no longer present and uh, not limiting our conductivity, which is of course exactly what we want. So we have uh, demonstrated these glasses can be tailored through their wide compositional ranges, um, the significant benefits of all these uh, properties. So let's look a little bit more now in detail at some specific compositions that we've been working on more recently and some of the optimized processing techniques that our group has developed. We're in this family of lithium, silicon, phosphorus, uh, sulfur. Uh, Beige and Pierre have talk, listened to me talk about mixed glass former effects. So this is a mixed glass former. We use phosphorus because it's low cost. We use silicon because it's also low cost, but a great glass former. I've talked about uh, oxysulfide compositions, and I'll show you one. More recently, we've actually began working on mixed glass former, mixed oxysulfide nitride compositions. We started putting a little bit of nitrogen uh, into uh, our glasses, and I'll show you the, the beneficial aspects uh, of doing this. Uh, these glasses are melted rather traditionally, but inside a glove box. Uh, they range in temperatures. Uh, they quench to below uh, the glass transition temperature and annealed. And then, of course, we take X-ray uh, powder to patterns, and we see very little, if any, uh, crystallization uh, of these uh, glasses. And we get monolithic glass pieces. We do this in two stages. Initially, we make small three or four gram samples, and then we do all the electrochemical, all the thermal, all the testing on these small 
relatively low cost samples. And then we pick an optimized composition and scale that up. And I'll talk about that. But let's talk about the small uh, scale work where we're just proof uh, testing, as it were, uh, the glasses. One of the first tests we do is thermal stability. And here I mean thermal stability against crystallization. Uh, you can see they've got a glass transition temperature around uh, 300 degrees Celsius. This is a mixed glass former phosphorus and silicon. Um, we vary these ratios a lot. I'm just using one here, but you can see the working range is rather modest. About 50 degrees above the glass transition temperature crystallizes. Um, we can add some oxygen uh, uh, to that glass. I'm sorry, uh, there's a typo here. This should be P2O5. I didn't quite get that one fixed. We call that a lipso glass. And you can see we increase the range to about 74 degrees. And then uh, when we add the oxygen and the nitrogen, then we increase that working range out to about 100 degrees. And I, I don't know if you can see this or not. This optical image has two things. It has the polished glass disc that we're gonna do for conductivity and Raman and all of that. But also it's got a surface here where you can see the little scratches left over uh, from polishing, uh, just to show you that we can cast these discs. So these glasses improve in their resistance to crystallization uh, and we get about a hundred degree working range. And that what, that's what we've found is about the minimum we need for processability. I'll show you some more detailed crystallization studies uh, in a moment, uh, but at least this gives us a way to proof test the glasses and move on uh, in further. So uh, we do a lot of spectroscopic analysis. I'll talk about Raman and NMR. It's very uh, important to characterize these uh, glasses. And this uh, Raman spectra of these, again, I, I, just to make the simple notation, this is the pure sulfide, the oxysulfide, the oxysulfide nitride. Those are the same compositions I showed uh, in the previous graph. What I want to highlight is this graph, this, this figure right here, this figure, this peak right here, which is associated actually with a defect structure. There's supposed to be a sulfur in there. And that defect structure makes this two things, increases the electronic conductivity because that phosphorus phosphorus bond, but it also increases the, the reducibility of this glass. And so as we add oxygen and as we add oxynitride, it decreases that defect band uh, which is important. What is left behind are these things called P0. We've got a lot of modifier in the glass. If you look real carefully, it's about 70% lithium sulfide, only about 30% of the glass former. And that creates these very highly charged modified structures. And what we find is that the oxygen and sulfur substitute on the, on the phosphorus uh, cation. We also get some, and as we add oxygen, as perhaps expected, we see these oxygen peaks come in and it looks like the phosphorus takes the sulfur and the silicon takes the oxygen, probably in line with the Gibbs free energy formation, the high, highly negative Gibbs free energy formation of the silicon. We can do a little bit better uh, in, uh, in NMR spectroscopy. Uh, so I'm going to show you two uh, spectroscopies, 31 phosphorus to look at the phosphorus structures and 29 silicon to look at the silicon. Let's start with the, uh, the, the, the phosphorus. As you can see, that defect structure is present in the pure sulfide and rapidly goes away uh, when we get to the, the oxysulfide and oxynitrite glasses, which is a great thing. Somewhat unexpected, but a great thing uh, that the oxygen kind of uh, uh, reacts with that to form a, norm, a, a normal phosphorus, oxygen phosphorus uh, linkage. So we can identify the P0 structures. And then uh, going on to the silicon, uh, then you can see, the, remember the phosphorus takes the sulfur, the silicon takes the oxygen because of that more negative Gibbs free energy formation of silicate structures. And you can see we, can, we have some silicon sulfide structures, but now you see we can clearly identify mixed oxy sulfides. And what you'll see is what you might expect. We have uh, SI3 with one oxygen, SI2s with two oxygens, SI, S1O3 with three oxygen. And then at highest, uh, most downfield shift, we have pure oxy uh, uh, silicates in these structures. And I won't go into all the details today, but we can identify those as a function of composition and do a whole structural map. 
but just to suffice it to say at this stage, we've got a very good handle on what the underlying atomic level structure is of these nominally amorphous materials. They have beautiful structures at the short range order. Long range order, yes, they're not crystalline, but the short range order is quite, quite well defined. And honestly, with advanced spectroscopies like NMR, we can identify them in a fairly straightforward uh, manner. We don't have any techniques to identify nitrogen yet. Uh, so mostly focus your attention on the far right uh, frame where we look at nitrogen, but we can identify the, um, the uh, phosphorus structures, we can identify the silicon structures, and we can also identify the sulfur structures. But what's interesting is perhaps as expected, we can identify the nitrogen uh, through XBS. Of course, the pure oxysulfide has no nitrogen and the pure phosphorus sulfide, silicon sulfide, phosphorus sulfide glass has no nitrogen. And we can deconvolute uh, this one and identify that the nitrogen goes into the glass as a tri-coordinated nitrogen. Um, that's a lot to have for a seminar uh, today, but there are two types of nitrogens possible. One is a doubly bonded nitrogen, and one is what we call this tri-cluster. And this tri-cluster seems to be the only one present in, uh, in our glasses. And we're working to understand that in more detail, but suffice it to say, uh, NMR and other spectroscopies allow us to identify the phosphorus and, and the silicon and the sulfur. The XPS allows us to identify the nitrogen structures. And it looks like we have this uh, threefold uh, tricluster, which is a very strong cr cross-linking uh, species, which might explain the slightly higher TG and might explain the slightly larger uh, working range uh, before uh, crystallization. Okay, uh, let's move on now uh, to the second part of the talk, and that is some of the electrochemical uh, behaviors. Here's the Arrhenius plot of the conductivity, uh, and you can see uh, that what's uh, maybe perhaps somewhat surprising, you would think as we add oxygen, we would lower the conductivity. In fact, if you look carefully, uh, the oxygen does lower the conductivity slightly here, so the sulfur, the pure sulfides in black in the middle, and it uh, lowers the conductivity initially, but our oxysulfide nitrogen actually has a slightly uh, higher conduct, uh, conductivity uh, as seen here. But nominally, these conductivities are slightly lower than the pure sulfide on the order of 10 to minus three that we see, and that's probably an effect of adding some oxygen into the glass, uh, lowering its conductivity. But nonetheless, uh, we have the highest conductivity in our glass with the oxygen and nitrogen, which we see probably is going to have advantageous uh, behavior uh, when we look at other properties. So they all have uh, nominally high conductivities about on the range of uh, 10 to the minus four uh, kind of, uh, inverse ohms, uh, inverse uh, centimeter. And so, but it also means that we can optimize the, comp the composition of these glasses to improve the conductivity and improve all the other uh, physical properties. So let's look at some of the electrochemical uh, behaviors uh, of these glasses. Uh, remind you here, uh, here's a cyclic voltammetry where we've got one, one side of the glass um, is uh, lithium metal and the other side of the glass is stainless steel. By using that uh, stainless steel, we can apply a positive voltage. If we just put lithium metal on both sides, we're stuck at zero volts versus lithium. But by having this stainless steel uh, electrode, we can pull that electrode to positive oxidizing potentials and kind of imitate what a cathode would be doing uh, to the glass. And you can see here at zero volts, this is a milliamp scale. You can see we're just plating and stripping, uh, plating and positive current, stripping and negative. We're just plating and stripping glass off of the lithium side of the cell. On the other side of the cell, we just go positive and nothing happens. Well, you'll see on the other hand, this scale is milliamp. That would be the currents operating in the battery. But for long-term storage and long-term operation, we have to go to a finer scale to see if there isn't anything happening uh, at a finer scale. So far, it looks like we're stable well out to five volts, but let's look a little more carefully. Um, and when we do that, now we're a thousand times uh, finer scale. We're in the micro amp range. There is no peak here because we're now looking slightly zero, slightly above zero volts and more positive. We, if we go to lower 
uh, negative voltages, all we do is just plate and strip and it dominates everything. So we start it slightly above zero so we can just see the electrochemistry. We, we know they're stable in contact with lithium metal. Let's look at higher voltages. And you can see at a thousand fold increase in scale, we do see a little bit of chemistry, which we think is associated with some of these sulfide uh, sulfur forms. Remember, sulfur is about a three volt cathode. So we're, it's not too surprising in the pure sulfide glass that we get a little bit of chemistry going on there. Most of the sulfur is sulfide, but some sulfur is probably uh, in the reduced pure sulfur uh, form and we get some current out of that. When we go to the oxysulfide now, you see we've narrowed that window up a lot. Maybe that oxygen is going in and oxidizing that uh, sulfur and eliminating it. Uh, then when we go to the oxysulfide nitride, we've really flattened that curve out. We're, again, we're in the microamp. If you look at this, we're actually down into the nanoamps. And that's the kind of uh, stability uh, that we need for long-term plating uh, and stripping and uh, battery performance. So just kind of a note to those in this area, when you see these milliamp types of scale, everything looks <laughs> flat on a milliamp scale. Look down at the microamp and nanoamp, and that's where uh, you really need to see whether there's any um, uh, reactions going on. So these glasses look very stable, both at reducing potentials and at oxidizing potentials. So oxygen and nitrogen seem to suppress any of these side reactions, which we think are primarily uh, excess sulfur. Maybe that's excess sulfur. Remember I talked about that phosphorus-phosphorus bond? Well, that sulfur has got to go somewhere. So maybe it's coming out into the glass. And as we add oxygen, as we add nitrogen, we tend to clean up. Remember that defect site went way down. Maybe that's what's going on. We're kind of cleaning up the glass and eliminating that uh, sulfur. Let's look at electrochemical impedance now. We're back to symmetric cells, and I've blown this up quite a bit. This is the pure sulfide. What we would like to have is a very simple arc at very low impedance like this. We don't want to have any impedance across that cell. We want to have a very small impedance, but you see what happens every 30 minutes. We just simply take another impedance diagram. We're just sweeping the frequency, measuring the impedance. And if it was perfectly stable and nothing happened, it would stay here, but it doesn't. It grows dramatically. And notice the impedance, 5,000 ohms, very large impedance. It would basically just shut down the battery. You wouldn't be able to get any current through it. Um, There's just to show you what that looks like. It started there. If you look very, very carefully, you can see that tiny little arc down there. Because the conductivity of these glasses is very high, the impedance is low, but you can see it grows. This is out to about 30 or 40,000 ohms. So this is a non-starter for a battery. Uh, and so the lithium uh, pure sulfide glass reacts quickly uh, and is unstable in a lithium metal anode. The uh, oxysulfide is a lot better. The impedance is high, about 4,000, uh, rather than a couple hundred here. Uh, but you see it's relatively stable. It still grows a little bit, uh, but it's much more stable. Uh, than the pure sulfide. And then you might imagine our pure, sulf our pure oxysulfide, uh, this is the data I showed you in the kind of uh, preamble of the talk. Um, this is com near, uh, completely stable and very uh, low impedance uh, over a very long time. These are uh, multiple hours uh, runs, meaning that our glass does what we want it to do, just stay uh, stable in contact with that lithium uh, metal uh, interface. Okay. Uh, then the other thing we need to, to uh, test on in these glasses is something called a critical current density. Um, a critical current density is how much current can you drive through the glass before it fails. It's kind of a current, anal a, a, a current uh, analog to a breakdown voltage. Breakdown voltage, you keep increasing the voltage until something bad happens in the material and it fails. Well, here we're just pushing more and more current, lithium ion current, through the glass until something bad happens. And we want to make sure we can get into the one to two milliamp per square centimeters. And remember that milli, a milliamp is associated with about a milli Siemens conductivity, 10 to minus three conductivity. Most of our cell phones operate in that milliamp range. So that's where that 10 to the minus three millisiemen conductivity comes from. So uh, in, this, in, uh, in, in, in these plots, so I've got again, uh, I've got a lithium metal glass. I've got a lithium metal on both sides. I've got glass in the middle. 
And I'm simply applying a voltage across those. I'm using the lithium metal as a metal anode uh, and doing two things at one time. I'm creating a voltage across the lithium metal. And the only thing that can happen is the lithium ions flow through the cell. Uh, and the higher the voltage, Ohm's law says, the higher that lithium ion current uh, should be. And that's what's shown here. The, the, the red is the voltage. If you look real carefully, you can see the red's the voltage and the blue uh, is the responding current. Now these are galvanostatic measurements. We apply whatever voltage is necessary to get a responding current. And you can see the current plateaus are constant. They're growing because we purposely wanna keep going until we destroy the glass as it were, until we break down the glass. But it's the voltage you see uh, that's growing. And now if Ohm's law is, if, is held, these flat current plots would be associated with flat voltage plots. And that's not what happens. See, there's some structure. See how it grows with time, grows with time, grows with time. Well, what's happening? Well, the glass, remember, the pure sulfide reacts with the, the glass and it forms a more and more resistive layer. And it takes more and more voltage with time to create that, uh, that plateau that constant uh, current. On the other hand, if we look, and I've, I've, I've zoomed in and, and sped this up a little bit for you. Um, a couple of things you look here, uh, if you look at, this is the voltage, this is in literal volts, this is 10 volts, okay? That's more than the full volts you'd ever get out of a cell. Now these are in uh, 0.1 volts. So this is a hundred times, hundred times uh, smaller voltage. Uh, but yet look at the currents. They're a little barrel on the order of 0 0.5, 0 0.2. They're a little lower, but not that much lower. And you can see now the perfect ohmic behavior. We drive this uh, square current with a square voltage and square voltage and square voltage. So you can see at this range, the glass is acting ohmic. It's, it means that the glass is chemically stable at the interface. We apply a voltage and yep, the ions move across the glass uh, and uh, produce uh, a, a stable a current. Now, these glasses don't have quite a, as high a conductivity as we want right now, so we can warm this up uh, and run at even higher currents. Now look at the current densities, two, two milliamps, five milliamps, and the, the uh, pure sulfide you see keeps up uh, at high voltage. Remember, these are tens. It still takes uh, the high voltage. They're much less conductive. Remember on that Arrhenius plot, these things are orders of magnitude better conductors than the pure sulfide. And you can see this thing just really cascades out of, the voltage just grows dramatically. And interesting, it's growing on one side. This is one side of the battery, that's the other side of the battery. One side is reacting more than the other, which is interesting. The, uh, the, the, the oxysulfide glass things grow, grow, grow. And finally, when we got, get up into this range far above the one milliamp we need uh, for our cell phones and automobiles, we push it too hard. Eventually, you can't see it very well. It shorts out here when we just, that's our critical current density. I don't know if I've got that or not. Uh, where's that? Yeah, at about two milliamps, we, get our, we reach our critical current density but one milliamp is sufficient so we could get a good behavior uh, out of this oxysulfide nitride glass. Okay. Uh, just to show you uh, that, of course, you don't want to run your batter for just an hour or a couple hours. You want to run it for many hundreds of days, if not years. And that's just showed here that we can cycle uh, down in this, we can cycle down in this milliamp range for many, uh, many hours. Uh, hundreds of hours, but then, like we say, when we kick it above that uh, 1.8 or above 2 milliamp, it'll cycle there for a little while, while and it'll short out eventually. But we can run in this 1.5 milliamp range for hundreds of hours. This is a thick film glass. I haven't got to the thin film stuff yet, but this is a thick film glass, meaning we have pretty good uh, instability. Um, this is for the, the Lipson uh, composition. Okay, let me finish up then with a few slides uh, on uh, forming these glasses and, and thin films. Well, we form them uh, by first of all, uh, making a large preform. We form a preform and we heat it up and we pull it. And we have a, a large glass melter. It's the same as our small, except being uh, horizontal, everything's vertical. And I don't know if you can see these pictures or not, but we can melt about a kilogram of these uh, non oxysulfide nitride glasses. If you look real carefully, you can see the red melt. We use vitreous carbon crucibles. They're very stable to these sulfide melts. And we just warm them up uh, and we pour them out. 
uh, and we anneal them. And I think I've got a video and then we get something like this. We get a large preform. Uh, this is, this is uh, one of the very first fast ion conducting glass preforms. You can see that uh, here that we then melt. And uh, then after we have the preform, uh, then again, this is in our laboratory. We take that preform and pull it into a thin film. We just have a big old draw tower that sits inside an even bigger glass and uh, in, in bigger glove box. Our glasses nominally, as I showed, are stable in air, but even if they're stable in air, we would still pull them inside a glove box. If you're pulling a 20 micron thick film, where's my hand at? There we go. Uh, a 10 micron or a hundred micron dust particle would be catastrophic. So this is also to keep dust down and keep the films uh, clean. Uh, there's our preform uh, held at the top. You can see that's held up here at the top of the, pre, uh, of the furnace. And then the, the, the preform is loaded into the furnace, which is sitting in here. And there's a tiny little film right there. If you look real carefully, there's a tiny little film there. We clamp onto that and pull it. Uh, and then eventually, again, these are micron thick films. So what you're seeing, you're looking right through uh, one of these films, there's a film, you barely see, there's a little bit of reflection right there, you can see uh, we're pulling a 20 micron thick film uh, of this glass uh, in that bottom uh, picture. Just to show you, uh, this is uh, Adriana uh, Joyce, uh, let's see if I can get out of my uh, clicker here. Um, let's see, I gotta get off that, I, let's see, how we, here we go. There we go. Sorry. Uh, this is the, the crucibles come down uh, and, and it's and what she's going to do is she's going to pour out uh, an LIPO3. This is lithium metaphosphate. We've spent a lot of time looking at lithium metaphosphate. It's a terrible ion conductor, 10 to the minus nine, but it really helps us proof test. And you can see she's pouring that glass out into a preheated mold. Uh, this is a clear glass and you can see she just pours it out. And then the, the, the mold here is, you can see my pointer is sitting at about 290 degrees just below the glass transition temperature at the annealing point. She'll raise the furnace, this will go up into the furnace uh, and then she quenches that out. And that'll sit there and anneal uh, for, for quite a while. Um, looking over her shoulder, uh, just to so, show you in a little bit more detail, uh, so you can kind of see, this is a vitreous carbon crucible inside the glove box. And she's swirling around to get it nice and uniform. And then she just pours that out into that mold. And that's the advantage uh, of these glasses that just don't crystallize. They have a, uh, uh, a large working range and she just uh, drops it off and then uh, is gonna put the uh, a, uh, cover on top of it. And that'll anneal that glass. And you can see uh, that we can make preforms that are 10 centimeters wide, about 30 centimeters long. and. Uh, are, are, are amenable to our uh, drawing process. Let's see if I can get back to my, where's my, oops, I don't know what happened there. Don't want to do that. Let's see, where is my, there we go. All right. So what I'm going to talk about now is using uh, lithium metaphosphate as our, as our trial glass. We're working on our oxysulfide nitride glasses, continuing to optimize so we can get to the right volumes. Uh, but again, this is a lithium metaphosphate glass. You can see one edge here, another edge here uh, being uh, drawn so that, uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from. My voice is on or something, that's interesting. Um, let me see if I can get out of that. What happened? Anybody know what's happening there? I'll turn that off, maybe. There we go. Maybe that, that did it. Okay. Let me go back to my, there we go. That was interesting. All right. So we can pull these films. Uh, here we have about 250 grams of glass with Adriana, Adriana pulled out. We get 20 to 100 microns thick, about 10 centimeters long. We get meters of that film out of that one preform. And here you can see one's drawn at about uh, 19 microns. You can see the little piece of glass that we fractured off and and measuring the thickness of it there. So uh, how do we know what temperature to draw these uh, at? Well, we know the viscosity, about 10 to the seven is where we need to draw, but how do we know the viscosity? Well, we take advantage of John Morrow uh, and others, uh, and they came up and developed this MIEGA model, 
that's not only very powerful at fitting data, but you can measure the parameters of the Maega model by doing DSC experiments. You don't have to do uh, full viscosity measurements. And there's a lot of parameters, but one of the most important parameters is the fragility exponent here, M. And we get that by doing a series of heating and cooling experiments. And so we can get the, the, the fragility parameter, we know from other measurements what the infinite frequent, infinite temperature of viscosity is because they don't change that much. We can measure the TG of the glass. And so we can model the, uh, the viscosity and then predict the temperature uh, that we want to draw these films out. And then that's the, that's the plot here. So the data for LIPO3, another reason why we wanted to work with it is uh, high temperature and low temperature viscosities are known, the blue line, is the, my, the, is the Maega fit through that data using only our DSC data and the, uh, uh, the Maega model. And then what we do next is do a series of crystallization studies, right, to know where the crystallization temperature is. And let me turn to that next. Uh, so that after we know what the viscosity is, of course, we don't want the liquid to crystallize in uh, the working range, we want it to crystallize above and well above, or well above the crystallization. So then we have to figure out, well, what is the crystallization temperature? So we do a series of, and I think those are coming up, we do a series of heating rate studies where we just do, again, in the DSC, this happens to be ISU-6, apologize for that, that's that Lipson composition that I talked about. Uh, we do it a variety of rates, here's from 10 to 20, we get an onset temperature, uh, for the, uh, the plot. And you can see here, uh, we can then predict what is the crystallization temperature under the heating rate conditions, about one degree Celsius per minute of our draw. And this one's way out here. And so that would be our crystallization temperature. And then, whoops, sorry, I have to go backwards. Apologize for that. Then we can take that point and put it onto our viscosity to curve. And that gives us a qualifier. Well, we knew LIPO3 was a strong glass former, but it means that we can say, yep, that's why we can draw the film without crystallizing because our crystallization temperature at those drawing conditions is above our, um, our draw temperature. And that's what we're doing with all our other uh, glasses. Let me finish up uh, then just to show you a little bit more data on LIPO3. The films are identical to the bulk and you can see we have uh, the bulk, which is uh, uh, reference 36. We have a variety of different films from 35 microns all the way to about 700 microns. And the Raman spectra, it, it's hard to do NMR because they're so thin, but Raman spectra can be done and they're beautiful uh, reproducibility. And there's just long change of these P2 groups. and so. The structures are present as, uh, as expected. The conductivity, these are a variety of, I uh, apologize for going quickly because I want to uh, be respectable, respective of time. The conductivities, even from 50 microns all the way up to melt quench. Melt quench is about a one millimeter uh, thick chunk of glass made in a very different way, of course. Uh, but the conductivities, there's a little bit of variation, but by and large, the conductivities are unchanged uh, by the film uh, drawing condition. Of course, what's important is electrochemical behavior. And here now we're measuring for the very first time a 50 micron thin fast ion conducting glass. All the work I've reported over many, many years has always been on the thick samples, one to two millimeters in thickness. And here you can see we can do a symmetric cell, uh, again, lithium, uh, glass, uh, lithium. And as expected, there's a little bit of interface, but that interface decreases uh, with time. And this is across a 50 micron. Remember, human hair is about 100 microns. So this is half the thickness of a human hair. Uh, my students are making these impedance. And as expected, uh, the oxide glass is stable. It's kind of a low conductor, but just means we can do these measurements on our oxide glasses. We can cycle the glass. There's a little bit of variation you see here, but it gets better. Remember, the impedance is decreasing, so the voltage required to generate that constant current is smaller. And there's a little oscillation here. We've, we didn't think about it, but our, our room temperature and our, the temperature in our laboratory is cycling daily, uh, and we didn't think about that. We've since figured that out and, and thermally isolated them better, but that's what that is. The decrease is the cell getting better with time. The oscillation is... Uh, showing up from the temperature isolation. But if you look over here, these are nanoamps, right? Because remember, lithium metaphosphate is a, is a poor ion conductor. 
gives us proof of per, proof of technique and proof of a concept, but nonetheless uh, capable. And then finally, uh, if I'm okay on time, just one more, two or more slides, we can cycle. We warm these uh, samples up a little bit because the conductivity oxide is pretty low and you can just see they're just perfectly square. Remember, this is 50 microns of glass. We cycle it at 60 degrees Celsius. We cycle it at 90 degrees Celsius. Our currents now go from nanos to micro because of that exponential dependence on, on uh, on uh, temperature, but they're perfectly flat. They're just, they're just ohmic in every respect, meaning that the glass is perfectly stable uh, and, and cycling. We can push them. I think that's what's coming up here. We can keep pushing these things uh, to see where they fail. We go up to 90 degrees uh, and we just, that's what we're doing here. We got up to about 15 microamps in this case and it didn't fail. So we pushed it even harder. Uh, and we got up to about 100 microamps. And finally, you can see right here at about 100 microamps at 90 degrees, this glass failed. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the, the current, of course, is, is not changing, uh, but the voltage, right? This is now metallic lithium through the glass. These dendrites shorted out the glass. So it took a lot, but we eventually uh, shorted it out. Just, I think that's in the next one, just to show you. Now, uh, let me wrap up with this slide. So where are we looking long-term? So this is the behavior I just showed you. Many volts required to drive the, 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 the even microamps of current that we get. If we go, th now this data I'm about to show you is not, uh, this is not uh, experimental data, but this is our expected data that if we have, instead of a 10 to the minus, where's it at? 10 to the minus seven conductivity of LiPO3, but rather a 10 to the minus three, then everything's reversed. You see, here's our current now, way up at our three milliamp, but the driving voltage is only about 0.02. What that means is that a battery that gives four volts from, from a normal battery, only about 0.02 of that volt is lost internally. The IR loss, is 0.02, so that's two parts out of 400. Uh, that's 0.05%, so very little loss. And so that's that bodes well for us. When, once we get our compositions worked out that we can draw them into film, we kind of expect uh, this behavior. I think I'm coming up on time, so I think I'm gonna wrap things up. Uh, just to finally, just to show you a little bit of scale up, uh, if, we, if we have a 2000 gram preform, uh, we pull it into 50 square meters of film. We get about 30 mil, mil, megajoules, four volts, uh, 10 microns of lithium. Uh, everybody's interested in a gigafactory. Well, a gigafactory would take about 34, 34 of those glass preforms because we stretch it out so much. Uh, 34 preforms a day could, could make a, a gigajoule of equivalent gigajoule of battery. So you'd have 34 draw towers, which is probably not an unreasonable uh, amount. Uh, glass can be, be very low cost. And so our cost of our raw materials on the order of 25 cents a gram, much more expensive than you know, ordinary chemicals, but nonetheless, because we stretch it out, that, that's about $10 a square meter, uh, which is a very, very good cost and comparable to what's in our cell phones uh, today. So with that, let me wrap up uh, and, and conclude. Uh, this wide compositional variation of these glassy solid electrolytes enables a simultaneous optimization of kind of the fundamental properties, chemical stability, electrochemical stability, and then oxidation and reducing stability uh, and then also strong resistance uh, to crystallization. We've demonstrated how we can form the, the 20 microns. And what I've reported on today, and I hope to report on in the future, that we've reported on this lithium metaphosphate test glass uh, that looks very, very promising in terms of uh, our technique. I'll wrap up uh, with an acknowledgement. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, I'll take this opportunity to acknowledge the National Science Foundation. I've been continuously funded by the ceramics program ever since I started at Iowa State. And it's really on that long-term uh, rate of funding that I've been able to, to do a lot of this work. More recently funded by ARPA-E and, and now funded by the uh, EERE Vehicular Technology Office and even some NASA and then even recently some Iowa Energy uh, funding. With that, I'll close and uh, thank you very much for your time. I do hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. So thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, Steve. That's
a lot of information. Um, I'm sure there's questions. I think Candice already has one. Uh, if you want to go ahead and ask the question. All right. Um, hi, Steve. This is Candice Chan. Thanks hi, for hi. <laughs> Thanks for a really exciting talk, and I really like to see the the pictures from your lab of your your um, your glass forming equipment. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how many gloves you have on that glove box because that looked really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's 10 or 10 or 12, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Um, so so the glove box is really um, a, a nice visual to show how um, there are stability issues with these sulfides, especially. And you had hinted this at the beginning that by by adding the oxygen, you get improved stability. Right. Um, and I'm wondering um, to what extent that's feasible with the oxygen and the nitrogen, can we actually use these tricks to get these sulfides to be more stable so that they're not um, creating any H2S at all? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it, certainly, at, certainly at dry room conditions. That's what we're, we're headed towards dry room conditions. So we, I think probably doing all of this inside a glove box on a commercial scale is probably a, a non-starter. So we're headed towards uh, dry room uh, conditions. Um, and so that's where we're testing at. And I think so. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's going to be hard to get both the conductivity and dry room stability. But I think if we can maintain our 10 to the minus three and at 20 microns, our sheet resistance is going to be right where we need. Uh, and then uh, also, especially for automobile, where we might be able to use a little bit warmer temperatures, uh, then I think we're clearly in the ballpark for meeting the conductivity and air stability processing conditions. Well, that would be really great. Yeah. And is it is it really the addition of the oxygen or does the nitrogen also contribute? We think it's both. Uh, what we found from our NMR is that the oxygen goes towards the silica silicon and protects the silicon from lithiation because you know silicon will lithiate. So if we oxidize the silicon, the oxygen protects the silicon. The nitrogen preferentially goes to the phosphorus. And we know phosphorus, nipon, lipon, and nitrides, those are stable. So the oxygen goes to the silicon to protect it. The nitrogen goes to the phosphorus to protect it. And we end up with a chemically stable electrolyte. Okay, thank you, great. Yeah. Here, I have kind of a, a random question. Uh, it, it's really exciting to see that you can actually draw these these glasses, and uh, I, I was just wondering, you know, the 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 stability range looks good enough to make fibers. Is there any reason it would be interesting to have like a a very long range ionic conductor that you can think of? I don't, I don't know that, uh, but, but what you can't, an another idea could be instead of pulling a film, pull a whole bunch of fiber, stack the fiber down and then deform it, uh, mash the fiber down. It might be easier to form fibers and then, and then viscoelastically deform, deform a stack of fiber uh, into a mat. Or, or, or have a, have a fiber reinforced uh, network. And if you have enough fiber, it's all volume, right? If you have enough fiber and then you have a, 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 uh, an inert binder, maybe the ions can move around and move through the fiber network and yet be maybe a little bit tougher uh, overall uh, network because it's a fiber reinforced polymer. But the ions are conducting through the, uh, through the, uh, through the filamentary nature uh, of the fibers. Sounds good. Any other uh, questions? So, uh, Dimitri? Uh, oh, hello, Dr. Martin. Uh, hey, Dimitri. Hear from you again. Yeah, uh, good to hear you. Good to hear you, Dimitri. Dimitri was a uh, born undergraduate at Iowa State, so now working, yeah, working I, doing, doing great things for Pierre, I think, right? <laughs> All right. I, I hope. <laughs> uh, like, I had a, qu a question regarding uh, has there any? Ha have uh, you had any success though with uh, working with the sodium versions of these glasses uh, or is that not part of uh, uh, your focus right now? Yeah, so we've had, in, in fact, there's a whole, I, I thought about talking about both, but as you saw here, I probably put too much into even just the lithium. <laughs> um, but no, we've had a great deal of success with sodium. Um, what we're finding, and we're starting to work with uh, Edgar uh, Zanotto and others on crystal, crystallization, 
all, there's kind of a standing joke and you, you, you were aware of this when you worked in our group, kind of everything we make in sodium makes a glass, everything we make in lithium crystallizes. Um, we're not quite sure whether it's just a melting point lowering a thing or not, but in fact, some of our first films were uh, sodium and we're having a great deal of success making the combination of all the electrochemical properties we need and resistance to crystallization in the sodium glasses. Uh, they just, they literally do not crystallize, which is amazing. Um, and the lithiums are a little more stubborn. I think it's part in part because they're higher melting. I think it's part because the higher field strength of the lithium, but we've had a lot of good success on sodium. And in fact, we're a little bit closer on full cells to, in sodium than we are in lithium because of that. We can make full scales, cells at one millimeter, but I mean full cells at thin film on sodium, a little farther ahead than we are actually on, on lithium. What conductivity range do you get with the sodium? It's a little lower, uh, 10 to the minus five at room temperature. Uh, but with grid scale energy storage, we certainly think we could go up to at least 100 degrees, maybe even higher, but 100 degrees. And if we can get into 10 to minus four on sodium, then the grid just doesn't have the high energy, high current densities that the portable does, especially automobile. So 10 to the minus four conductivities on grid scale seems to be kind of that threshold. And we can get that by warming them up, which we think in a grid scale application we can. Uh, any other questions? Ranko? Oh, hi, Ranko. You're, you're making thin films bring, brings back fond memories, of course. <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we tried to very unsuccessfully in our laboratory with you, that's exactly right, yeah. It's about 20 years back or so. That is, anyway, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was wondering, how thin can you make these films? And what, what kind of electric fields are across these? Yeah, so, so right now uh, in terms, of, we have two ways. We can make a small amount of very thin film, probably down to the 10 micron range. But if we want to kind of continuously hold on to it and pull it, the 20 micron, the 19 micron is, is the 20. 19, 20 microns is, is pretty common for yeah. us. We stiffen them up a little bit for measurements. We go into the 75 microns. They just get a little bit easier to handle, uh, but we can get down into the 10 micron uh, range. As for applied voltages, uh, you know, we purposely stay low in voltage, um, as you saw there. Uh, you know, into the 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So I don't know, we've got 0 0.1 volt over uh, 20 microns. That's 0 0.05 megavolts per meter, I guess. Um, so those are the kind of voltage ranges. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a good point though. You know, when you get so thin, you can start to think about breakdown, uh, 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 breakdown voltages and whether well, or not- I'm thinking about something like that. breakdown and I'm thinking about you the, the nonlinear connectivity properties. Oh, oh yeah. Which there we was could a easily, study. There we, was a we study. Could measure those. Yeah, there was a study a few years ago, right? And some German workers published that paper where they thought they were seeing that they made very thin films. They were mm -hmm. they were submicron. I don't think they're made by pulling and drawing. And they thought they saw that, but I think in the end they retracted that. I think in the end they they decided it was diffusion or something of gold in the electrolyte and retracted it that they didn't see any nonlinear behavior. But I think it's still an open question. Uh, and one we could provide you some film for to uh, certainly we could provide you the lithium metaphosphate film to to use. Yeah, that'll be interesting to do. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Any other questions? Three. I mean, what do, what do they do in auction? Yeah. I'm sorry? No, I was oh. like, oh, uh, there's a question on whether you see any phase separation. 
Um, yes, we do. Uh, when we get to these high, uh, highly complex liquids, uh, we can see phase separation. Of course, crystallization is an example of phase separation, but liquid liquid phase separation in some compositions we do. Uh, and we kind of have, and I, I, I didn't quite explain that, we kind of dance around those compositions where we're starting to create a catalog and a library of compositions that stay homogeneous, but we do in some instances see uh, phase separation into, into separate liquids. Uh, and of course that causes all kinds of problems. So we try to stay away from those compositions. But generally, the, all these compositions we work on are, are invert compositions where the modifier content, the sodium sulfide, lithium sulfide, lithium oxide, lithium sulfide is a higher concentration actually than the glass former. Uh, the, the glasses I showed today are about 67 lithium sulfide, 33 glass former. And it generally is true that when we have such high ionic, high ionic character of the liquid, that kind of cleans up the structures and we don't see phase separation. But we can, we have seen it and, and we just work away from those compositions generally by just simply increasing the modifier content. There's another question. Um, if you can, is high, back to variation, I mean, it's, it's in the chat. So Steve, if you're... I don't know if I can see that or not. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't open up chat. Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, we'd want no activation energy. We'd want that Arrhenius plot to be flat, right? We want we want the the pre-exponential factor and the curve to just come up and be perfectly flat. Um, and it, it, it the high activation energy uh, does two things for it. It kind of raises the conductivity, but is a little bit of a problem. What that means with the higher activation energy, we have more temperature dependence uh, to the conductivity. But again. Uh, if we think about you know, 100 degrees Celsius, maybe at an absolute maximum, probably even a cell phone, 70 degrees Celsius to maybe zero or minus 20, that's a small range of temperature. And we don't see quite, you know, it's not as big a problem, but we, we really do want that, that uh, conductivity uh, to be flat uh, with activation energy, but I don't think that'll ever happen. One interesting thing we are seeing, uh, however, is, and I've, I've showed this before and I've talked about it, is a non-Arrhenius behavior. As we increase the conductivity, uh, the curve does in fact start to roll over with a smaller activation energy at high temperature, kind of imitating that uh, behavior. We're not quite sure where that's coming from. Uh, we've got some ideas, I've written some papers on it. I think we've proven it to be uh, real, uh, but it does in some way, it helps flatten out the curve, but also it may be putting a theoretical limit that is not just the pre-exponential factor. It may be putting another limit to the conductivity of just how high we can get ions moving into solid state. Um, an idea might be kind of jamming effects, right? You've got so many lithium ions, they're moving so fast, you know, they just get, they get clogged up on the highway of ion conduction, they just slow down not unlike uh, automobile traffic. So we're looking into that as a possible mechanism of this non-Arrhenius conductivity at higher temperatures. Uh, what we see now is, uh, is, is not spinodal, it's nucleation and growth. We get, we get very nice uh, regions, uh, which we take, we, we don't think it's crystals forming, we think it liquid, a liquid droplet forms and then it crystallizes from some of the microscopy we've done. So we think uh, nucleation and growth, great question. Steve, uh, any, I mean, um, any information on the interfaces at the anode electrolyte interface. Yeah, so so we think the you think the interface is pretty well protected. Like I was telling Candace, it's pretty well protected. The oxygen goes and protects the silicon. The nitrogen goes and protects the phosphorus. We get a stable interface. When we don't have oxygen, when we don't have nitrogen, we have the pure sulfide. Uh, we haven't done as detailed a study on lithium, but we have in sodium, and it looks like sodium phosphide. Sodium reacts with the phosphorus to form a sodium phosphide, and then it must necessarily create compositionally a sodium sulfide. 
So we do get sodium phosphide and then that just keeps reacting. The more sodium, it's not limiting. It just kind of keeps going uh, and is not a limiting interface. So sodium phosphide, we presume lithium phosphide in the case of the sulfide glasses is another example of that. But uh, we do think that uh, the phosphides uh, are, are possible. On the, on the, uh, on the silicon dope glasses, uh, the, you know, the lithium will uh, lithiate silicon, right? And so we think lithium reacts with uh, silicon to form lithium. Lithium reacts with a silicon sulfide, silicon oxygen to form silicon plus lithium sulfide. More lithium comes in to form the lithium silicide, kind of in the same way uh, that it does on phosphorus. But if we can protect it, if we can add the oxygen to protect the silicon, add the nitrogen to protect the phosphorus, then we have a stable interface. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions and I think we slightly overshot our time. So if it's okay with everyone, I think let's thank uh, Dr. Steve Martin once again for a great talk. Uh, this talk's been recorded and will be on YouTube. So, so if anyone, uh, Pierre, sorry, and BG. Oh, you guys were clapping. Yes. Thanks everyone. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Steve, excellent talk. Great talk. Okay. Great.